Good evening. It is uh, Wednesday night, May the 11th of 2022. I'm Brother Steve, pastor at First Baptist Church, Sellersburg, Indiana. We're continuing our running study on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights of, of the New Testament, a study we've called Navigating the New Testament. We began by looking at uh, the very early story of the New Testament, John the Baptist and the life of Jesus. Then we looked at each book of the New Testament. We're taking our time now as we walk through the book of Revelation, not trying to be overly dramatic or sensational, just trying to examine the clear teachings of the book as an outline for you to study and, and to learn on your own. We come to the 11th chapter, and uh, this is an interesting chapter because this chapter produces a great deal of concern and speculation and questions, and throughout the ages, it's been one of the more challenging chapters of the book. Uh, first off, I want you to understand that we need to understand that God's temple will be rebuilt, verses 1 through 2. We see that there was given to me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God in the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out. Measure it not, for it is given unto Gentiles, and a holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Now, most scholars would agree that there must be a future temple built because the temple in Jerusalem is, is not there. It has been destroyed. When you see a picture of Jerusalem, you see the golden dome, and uh, some people unfortunately think that's the temple. That is the Islamic temple. That is the Dome of the Rock Mosque. That is not a holy place for God's people. And there's great debate among scholars. The, does the Dome of the Rock Mosque have to be removed for the temple to be rebuilt? Or could the temple be rebuilt, be rebuilt and the, the court of the Gentiles is where the Dome of the Rock Mosque is? And every once in a while you'll hear somebody trying to blow up the Dome of the Rock Mosque to make way for a Jewish temple. Uh, we hear various times that there are people trying to relearn uh, how to sacrifice animals so when the temple's rebuilt, there is a temple project going on now among Jewish scholars. And, and we don't know a lot about how all this is going to come together. But John's going to measure a temple in the holy city. And it, it's going to be there. And the temple is the most important part. Now, the court of the Gentiles was important in the life and time of Jesus and in the various eras of the temple. But it's not part of what John's measuring here. It's irrelevant. So what we see is that God is doing something. A temple will be under God's protection. And it certainly be a part of God's plan as he is working there uh, to share the gospel and to work his ministry out. But notice that what the temple will be rebuilt, but we need to listen as, as God's truth always resounds. And notice he says here, and I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand, two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. And there are, these, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. If any man shall hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouths and devours their enemies. If any man shall hurt them, he must be uh, in this manner killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Oh, my gracious, the amount of people who speculated about these two witnesses and what their roles are. Um, Many scholars that I trust believe that these are uh, Elijah and Moses. Moses represents the law, Elijah the prophets. Some say perhaps Enoch and Elijah because neither of them tasted earthly death. What we do know about the two witnesses is that they have a purpose in God's redemptive plan. They are two olive trees. They are two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth, and they are unable to be hurt. They have God's power but they also have God's protection. And someone tries to hurt them, they breathe fire upon them, and they must be in that manner killed. They also have power over the heavens to shut it up so it not rain. A lot of people think that that links it to Elijah, but we, we really don't know the identity of the two witnesses. Biblical speculation, you know, that's, that's a good idea. You know, again, Moses represents the law. Uh, Elijah, the prophets, that's as good a guess as any. Uh, but these two witnesses receive power of God. Notice verse 3, I will give power unto my witnesses. They will prophesy. They will be protected. They will have power over the heavens to make it not rain. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood. And they can smite the earth with plagues. That's kind of a reference back, back to Moses as often as they will. So what we see in this is that God has a great truth for us. And the lesson of these two witnesses is extremely important. Now, again, this is a future time during the second half. 
right at, I think, the beginning of the second half of the tribulation. As I said, the first series of judgments is a little slower. The second half, they happen more rapidly and they are far more severe. So as the temple has been reestablished, the witnesses are there proclaiming truth. I found it interesting uh, in Tim LaHaye's writings, he argues that uh, anything that the, the two witnesses say must be Scripture, and it, it must align with the very clear teaching of Scripture because their power is from God. And I, I think that's an impressive thought for us to cherish, that it's the Word of God that proceeds as fire from their mouths. It is the Word of God that uh, provides protection. It is the Word of God that provides power for these witnesses. And I think there's a great lesson for us in that. The text goes on to tell us that, verses 7 through 10, that uh, when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Now, I think it's important to notice that when they finish their testimony, happens on God's schedule. Notice again, when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Well, we know where it is then. It's where our Lord was crucified. It's just outside of Jerusalem. They'll lay their dead bodies in the streets. And notice what verse 9 says, And they of the peoples and kindreds and tongues of the nation shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and shall send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. Now, there's a couple of things we need to pay attention to. First off, be aware that their witnesses will be killed and God's witnesses will be hated. There's nothing new in that. Since the early days of the church, there have been martyrs. Uh, Stephen was stoned, the earliest martyrs. We, we see that God has a history of people who've given their lives in his service. Uh, missionaries die on the field speaking in the name of Jesus. We we see the enemies of the Lord Jesus, the enemies of the church have, have killed throughout the ages men and women who've, who've stood and prophetically spoken the message of the word of God and of Jesus redemptive. But notice it says, when their work was finished, the beast that ascended. Now again, we could get lost on the idea of who the beast is. He, he is part of that unholy trinity. He is anti-God and all that he does. And he makes war against them. He overcomes them and kills them. And he leaves their bodies in the street and the world celebrates. Of every people and tribe and tongue and nation shall see their dead bodies three and a half days. Now, when I was a little boy, I remember when live television came to greater Cincinnati. Unfortunately, there was a horrific tragedy at a, a dinner theater nightclub place over in Northern Kentucky. And one of the local stations had live coverage, and the other two did not. And the one channel had their truck there with live pictures of this horrible tragedy there in northern Kentucky, and the other two did not. And I remember people saying, well, you know, we don't need to see everything live. And, and I can remember people saying, that I read commentaries that, we don't know how this will happen that every tribe and tongue and kindred could see these dead bodies. But well, we know today the world can watch things anywhere in live television, live on the Internet. None of us are even surprised that the whole world could watch a singular event. As we're filming the situation in the Ukraine, we get pictures of the horrors of war just right now. The whole world will watch as these dead bodies lay in the street. And people will celebrate it. They'll rejoice and make merry and send gifts. It will be like Christmas. They hate the message of Jesus so much that they will celebrate the death of his witnesses by making merry and exchanging gifts. God's witnesses will be killed. God's witnesses will be hated, but pay attention. God's judgment, God always gets the last word. Pick up with me at verse 11. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered unto them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. 
And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended to the, up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. In the same hour as there was a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were frightened and gave glory to the God of heavens. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe comes quickly. God always honors his servants. And God always deals with sinners. Now we praise him because right now his dealing with sinners is to offer them salvation. He made a way. In that day, judgment will be terrific. It will be terror filled. As these two witnesses are uh, re-energized with life, Great fear falls upon the crowd. The voice from heaven says, come up hither, mirroring Revelation chapter 4 when John is called up symbolically representing the church and, and the church then is in heaven as these two witnesses will be. And then judgment upon the earth. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And that next verse says, The seventh angel sounded, and there was great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Does that sound familiar? Handel's Messiah, as he wrote that wonderful piece of music in that great song, the Hallelujah Chorus. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats, fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art, which was, and which art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power, and thou hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come in the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that they should give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and unto the saints, and to them which fear thy name, small and great, shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunders and an earthquake and great hail. You know, in the midst of all the trauma of future judgment, God's timing is always right. And we can always find joy in that. I don't know what pain you have to deal with today. I don't know what sorrow you struggle with. But my Savior reigns. Today, when pain is real and sorrow seems abundant, Jesus is Lord. And on that day, in the midst of the horror of judgment, of tribulation, of great tribulation, the scene in heaven never loses sight of the fact that Jesus is Lord. And he shall reign forever and ever. The elders worship him. The world worships him. They give thanks because he has great power. If you ever wonder who he was, he's the one that was, that is, and is to come. His name is Jesus. I'm longing for that day when we worship him face to face. I think so many people read the 11th chapter and they get wrapped up on the witnesses and they miss the worship. Maybe today you're struggling with what the message of the Bible is all about. I can tell you it's all redemptive. God wants men, women, boys, and girls to repent. And in that repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus, come to Him in salvation. Please go to our website, fbc-sellersburg.org. Click on the link at the top that says the gospel. And there you'll find the simple truth from Scripture, how you can know Jesus. Maybe right now, the fear of the future is overwhelming, but maybe you could put your faith in Jesus. You need to acknowledge that you're a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages of your sin is death. Jesus took that death on the cross. We just celebrated Easter a few weeks ago. 
we know Jesus died a horrible death, the death that I deserved, the death that you deserved. And when we repent and place our faith in him, we receive life from him. He took my place. He took your place. He's worthy of our allegiance. He's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our devotion. Call on him tonight. Father, I pray that right now you'd speak to each heart. Help us to stay focused on Christ and to worship him, for he alone is worthy. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you.